So, so the meeting to order at uh, 4.05, um, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we just really wanted to, the board wanted to get together uh, with um, all the, as many staff members as could come, um, and just basically have a dialogue to see how things are going, and to express any concerns that you may have, and just you know, really an open session, um, and address any issues that, that you have in, in a positive sense. Okay, and, and uh, if there's any concern about speaking um, in, in a public way this way, public forum, that it's, you know, it's being recorded, it's an open meeting, um, please let us know. Uh, so, do we want to provide more context to the discussion? Mm -hmm. Why we're that, that was, do you want to do that, Brian? I was just going to say the same thing. I can, I can start. Sure. I'll just can chime in. Um, I, well, I, this sort of stemmed from the last meeting, but uh, to, kind of, to take it further back, the um, the boards collectively across the supervisory union for the last nine months or so have uh, been working around some sort of core shared goals across the supervisory union uh, on different elements, one around governance, one around uh, school uh, educational uh, performance and one around community engagement. And um, there has you know, been talk about uh, creating sort of measurable goals within the uh, student <coughs> achievement side of things. And uh, as we've sort of looked to create uh, some sort of broad goals across the supervisory union, there was this retreat that we had this summer, which was really the, the first time that the board is, all the boards have come together to do things, something that was a little bit more in depth than um, business meetings, and uh, it was a, a presentation from uh, a gentleman I'm sure you guys are all familiar with from communication since, since then, Nate Levinson, uh, and uh, it was a uh, an opportunity for uh, us to, to, to learn about some uh, different uh, approaches uh, that are being done here in Vermont and across the country uh, in terms of, uh, in particular, addressing um, uh, students that are struggling, but really how can that be applied to the larger uh, educational context and community. And, uh, you know, it was, and then we had a follow-up meeting and sort of uh, had a conversation around the table. Not all the board members were able to make the, the actual retreat, but uh, I know they also watched much of it, the recording, and uh, had an opportunity to just talk about what, what the takeaways were. Uh, and I have to say, uh, for as a board member, you spend a lot of time talking about really boring stuff, uh, and uh, it doesn't really often feel mission-driven. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Having an opportunity to at least uh, to engage in, in conversation and hear about the different things that is already being done um, that we knew and we learned more about across the supervisory union uh, that were uh, in some ways sort of uh, I guess reflecting what some of uh, was being discussed at that retreat uh, and uh, and other things as well was was exciting and uh, I think as as a board here, we started to talk about what are our, you know what are our priorities, and um, I know that there's been talk about a guarantee that's that's been surfaced. That was one of the takeaways uh, from the retreat was this idea of, of guarantees, and some of the different boards were floating this this idea around. Is we you know what are we going to uh, what sort of promises are we going to make uh, the, the kids in our uh, in our communities. Um, and I know I'm probably giving a pretty long-winded uh, explanation, but uh, I'm hoping it provides context. And uh, and so, and then we, to be quite honest with you, that's sort of where we we left it for a while because of sort of other business uh, and I don't want to call them priorities, but just other things sort of took over uh, from there, um, and and we sort of circled back to it. To a certain extent, uh, last a board meeting, and there was uh, several of you that actually were 
we're here to uh, share concerns. And I think, I'm hoping that perhaps um, what was talked about, some of the information that was provided there maybe helped to, to relieve some concerns about uh, you know, decisions or directions that were being, uh, being taken. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think for us as a board, uh, we, were, we are very much still in uh, sort of dialogue mode of, um, on, this, on this issue. But then across the, the supervisory union, uh, you know, we are looking at uh, sort of issues around student <coughs> performance, uh, you know, in particular around uh, reading and, and liter or, I'm sorry, literacy and math uh, that we're trying to, to wrestle with, you know, uh, what do we do about that? And uh, I think that uh, all along the way, sort of a, a part of that conversation has been leading to this conversation that we're having right now is that how do we, uh, how does the, the leadership and the bodies within the building figure out how we, um, we address these issues and how we prioritize the work that we're doing um, and, and what are our priorities to even begin with. And that's something that's actually been come pretty clear in the last couple of months I think across the um, five towns and six schools is what really are even our priorities within each of our schools and are they the same? Uh, and uh, so that, uh, is that, is that helpful? Is that that's excellent. Helpful? And I have a couple specific questions maybe that mm -hmm. can serve to open up the conversation. Okay. Um, one of them is how are we doing? Um, we've had a discussion about um, SVAC scores, about local assessments, and about grades. And I'm curious whether you think that those accurately reflect, you know, are those good measurements? Are they not? You know, what, what can we learn from that? And what are we not looking at that we also could be? Um, I also would love to hear specific thoughts that you have on the idea of a student guarantee. I think. Um, particular emphasis on, on math and literacy. Um, I would like to know um, anything that you'd like to see in particular, that's very open-ended, but I'd, I'd um, like to hear that. And then la last, how can we best communicate with you? Because I think that that is a real um, a desire that this board has is to, to not just make decisions in a vacuum, but to really have a sense, you know, certainly through Amy, but then also a good communication with you. Um, so those are those are some questions I have to, to have. So let's take the first first. How are we doing? Yeah. You know, I almost think it might be easier to kind of warm up first and do something that's a little more tangible than a large open-ended how are we doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we save that for more like the end. I was thinking in preparing for this, although I thought it was really solely focused on the student guarantee, um, so I'm a little uh, caught off guard, but I am thinking about the fact that, you know, the state has imposed this merger and um, the idea that we will be one SU. And I think about this school, and as we are going to these SU meetings and talking about core shared goals, what does the Rumney staff feel are the things that are so essential to Rumney that you've already done work in, you've already put investment of time, maybe some money and training that you really value that you would want us to bring back when we're talking about shared goals? So I think something like that maybe will help, and then we move along from there. Does that make sense? Can I add to that slightly? Yeah, Sorry, of course. Since we're all talking. Um, so definitely what Brian was saying, the, the WCSU board is really trying to prioritize. And while, so we have our list of goals within the WCSU, both tangible things and then sort of soft skills. And there's, there's a list of them that I have brought and we can share. Um, and we have to kind of, at some point, prioritize. And it's really, we're hoping as a union that we can sort of get the perspectives of each school before the merger when that might become more difficult. And while, of course, we would all like to provide all things for all students, it's probably, <coughs> excuse me, not, we, you know, something is gonna have to give, potentially something is gonna have to give. And so we have to decide from a funding perspective you know, what things do we really help to support? And so for me, that's a really big question 
is trying to get a, a feel for what are the most important things that, what are our goals here? Like, what do we want to fund? And so we sent out, or I sent out that original survey, and it was very open-ended. It was actually really helpful to see where everybody was coming from. And then there was a second survey that a few community members filled out that was really just ranking these priorities. And those results were very interesting. I will just say that math was not second or first. So um, it was, depending on how you look at the data, which we can talk about if you want. But um, so it was, it was just really, I guess we're trying, for me, I really want to know if we're happy to go back to the WCSU and say, what, what are we wanting to really, like, what are we really not willing to let go of? That for me is a big question. When I think about Romney, um, uh, and when I came to Romney, uh, we had such a reputation in this building, you had such a reputation of being this unbelievably supportive community school you know, where, where everyone was really invested in making sure that every child was successful. Um, and that word success was not test driven. That word success was um, joyful, passionate children who had multiple opportunities to learn in multiple ways, right? So it was, the arts were a phenomenal here in the integration of the arts, um, music, being outside, using our outside space as a classroom, um, not being a very standardized school, um, which was very, you know, and our students performed well. Our students were performing very well when I came here. Um, and I, that's what, exactly what I still want for all our kids right now, and I'm, I'm fearful that we are becoming a test-driven school. Um, and if we are focusing on only those measures, and you just said some things have to, be, some things have to go, um, we might improve the test scores of our children to become stronger readers and, and math students at the cost of hating school mm -hmm. and seeing learning as not an enjoyable um, venture for them and, and not <coughs> wanting to even be here. Um, and that is just the opposite of what we want, of, of what I want. Um, so I have a real concern when I hear um, we need to cut program, we, you know, some things are gonna have to be cut, we need to be standardized with the other schools. Um, the word guarantee <coughs> just <coughs> irritates me to no end. Um, <coughs> for so many reasons, and yet I have goals that my students are going to be performing at grade level. I mean, what they're supposed to be doing, that is our goal. Um, and I think we, we have to have high goals and expectations and work together to find ways to get all our students there creatively. Not just one path, but all those multiple paths that we know kids need to take. Um, and 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 not, like I said again, not just be so driven by just one measure. And so you had asked Loden about the measures here, and um, yeah, SBAC is just one. You know, third graders, it's the first time they've ever taken it, and those scores are just a baseline, right? So we have to be really careful about looking at those. Everything is on the computer, there's a lot of reading that they're not used to, a lot of writing on the computer. They still don't have keyboarding skills, right? It's just crazy where they still don't know where the Q key is and they have to be typing all this and it's, it's a lot of pressure. So, but it is a measure and, and we do look at it and we do value and, and, and then take what we see from it and inform instruction. Uh, the STAR 360, which is another one that we have in this building, is not a perfect measure. Um, my third graders were just, I walked around the room with a clipboard just to see what kinds of questions they were asking. And uh, one of the questions was 49,387 divided by 36 for a third grader. What is another name for 11 thirds? You know, that's like fifth and sixth grade math. And I thought, what's, what's going on here? Right? What, what is, um, and we don't have a way of looking at what questions they're asking. We have no way of knowing what the students are getting. All we get is just a, a report at the end. So it is a measure. I do understand that. And when children do perform poorly, um, it does seem to be indicative of what their classwork is. And yet, I don't want us to invest everything on just those two scores. Um, I don't know, else want to chime in? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, I think that I, you know, one thing I think Diane is trying to, to really stress is that 
you know, we do want to have high expectations for the students. We, we understand, um, and the, the leadership, not just in the school, but in the supervisor union, has been really um, trying to get the message across um, that, you know, that we want to have high expectations, and by having high expectations for all students, you know, it, it helps all students, not just the ones that are the, having the most difficulty, but it helps all students move ahead. Um, but at the same time, um, there's two things I wanted to say. Uh, you know, when the first survey came out, I wrote a fairly long um, response to the, to the first question, um, specifically speaking to some of the things in, De uh, in Levinson. Um, uh, because I felt like there were a lot of really good things there, but I felt, based on my experience as a teacher, I think there's more to the picture. It's not like there's things that are, you know, that need to be contradicted, but, but I think there's more to the picture, and I, I feel like there's more to the picture when we look at test results, because, um, you know, students are more than just machines for producing um, good test scores. And we could get those test scores up there. I think we will get those test scores up there. But I'd hate to have the price of that being that at the end of a school career, um, the, the students feel like, well, I've finally finished that. Now I can just go out and live my life. I'd rather have school be the kind of experience that really helps them um, so that when they're done with school, they realize that they're at the beginning of a learning journey. You know, and I think the only way that that can happen is for them to love learning, for them to love the experience that they have being part of a community where not just the, their classmates and not just the teachers and the building leadership, but the, the community as a whole, which is what I experienced when I first started working at Rummy. The school, the community as a whole, really is in love with the whole process. And so that, that love, I think, does just as much as high expectations and incentives and systems uh, to, to bring out that love of learning and to turn it into a lifelong, um, I guess, habit of how you, you know, uh, you know habit of thinking and, and just being a human being. Um, I, you know, um, I, just, I just really feel that um, I'd like to see teachers um, not being so pressed to manage the systems of data <coughs> gathering and data analysis that they don't have to time to love their jobs. Because if the teachers can't love their jobs as much as they used to, then it's going to be so much harder for them to create a, an atmosphere in the classroom so that the kids are going to love being part of that. I, I'd really like to see us look at these systems and the, and the, the non-systemic things that I think are important to me and to many teachers here as not part of a zero-sum game where you have to have one or the other. I'd really like us to value both and not forget about one for the sake of the other, even though you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, on, on systems so that we can get verifiable data. And so if you make sure that we're really providing equality of outcomes for students you know, in one level, I'd really like us to, to not have that eclipse you know, the whole other dimension. Just because, you know, we're standing on one side of the elephant and we can feel these things and we've got, we've got touch sensors so that I can feel the tail of the elephant and I can tell you everything about the tail of the elephant and I can tell you everything about the trunk of the elephant. I don't want us to feel so um, wrapped up in that that we forget about all the other things and don't even really know it's an elephant. So uh, that's... Can I make one comment about the two surveys? I also wrote a long um, response to the first survey. Um, when I saw the second survey, I instantly got a stress headache, and then I closed it, and there's no way I would ever fill out that survey, ranking seven curricular areas against each other. It's a Sophie's choice. That is not why we're here. Uh, and I understand you need guidance on, well, if something has to go, um, I'm not surprised that math didn't come out first or second if people were thinking about their children, but I, there's no way I would ever rank the seven curricular areas and put one of my colleagues' areas at the bottom. 
that's just not what this place is about. Where was that second survey? Yeah. It was just yeah. sent to us. It was just sent to us last. Yeah. I saw it in front from of From Porch Farm. Farm. So if you're not a Middlesex yeah. resident, we didn't get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I didn't feel, um, I mean, yeah, I didn't want to send it to the, anyway, it went out on Front Porch Forum and on Facebook, so. I didn't want to cause any trouble by trying to submit it. I mean, we had full board support, but it just seemed like we probably shouldn't send it to the administrative assistant. So, anyway. Is there a sense of things being lost now? Mm -hmm. And if there is, if there is, what is it? And if you know why, why? And that's a, you know, because yeah. you, you, I hear a lot about. <coughs> passion of being here and wanting to maintain that and if it's being lost it would be good to know that I think if if it's change. knowable yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else feels that way but the schedule change is a huge, it had it, it seems like it had a big impact on many people okay. how, if you know why <coughs> and how I mean those well I can speak from my from my perspective um, my my old schedule where I was teaching once a week for a, a longer chunk of time to students allowed me to at least um, so that's one part of it I that allowed me to be able to at least teach and have the kids maybe get engaged in their lesson before we had to clean up so I could teach and instruct have them work for a good chunk of time or an acceptable amount of time and then have time to clean up so that it was ready for the next class and so that I could be prepared for the next class and so that the students had a fair chance to come into a class that was ready for them so that they could do their best um, and it, so that was one thing and then the in the beginning of the year and this has changed and I'm grateful for it um, but we were responsible for transitioning the kids. So right now, uh, Allied Arts classes are back to back. So for example, I might switch with um, the librarian. And in the beginning, we were responsible for making sure the class that we had could swap over to the next location they were going. So I would swap my kids with library and her kids would come to me directly. And so it absolutely left no time for me to clean up or for any of us, I, well, I'll speak for myself, for me to get prepared, like to wash a brush or clear the tables or reset up the materials or, um, but anyway, um, so that was very, very, very stressful and I definitely couldn't do my best job in that position. So shorter classes where it was either like you forgo the instruction and have them work for the most amount of time they possibly could work for or have instruction and have them get started and say up oh, time to clean up um, so that short period of time is still happening but we did we did get some transition time although I still have I still have a class that it ends for one grade level and another grade level is waiting at the door. There's no transition time. So like I couldn't even, if I'm doing a different lesson from say I had five, six and then I'm getting three, four, there's no way to switch over materials. And so for the first 10 minutes of that class, um, students are helping me set up my class, which I think is completely um, unfair. It's, it's not best practice for them or for me. But that, so, but the, I will say that I was, we were listened to for, for some of this and I, we are not responsible for transitioning classes anymore. And it, it has made a big difference, but our, our schedule time is, is still really shortened. And I went from teaching one class a week to now teaching two shorter classes a week. And I don't think that's, um, it doesn't work very well. 
that's that's from my perspective as a visual arts teacher. Um, the, the same the same kind of result was in PE to um, the five six level decreased by sixty five minutes this year, um, one whole class down and then ten minutes for each class. So instead of forty five minute classes, it's thirty five. Um, so that's a pretty big chunk for them of movement time. Um, three four decreased by twenty minutes, so two forty fives to two thirty fives, and then the uh, first and second, um, 10 minutes, so just five minutes shorter than it has been in the past. Um, so, I mean, recommended by the state, we're not even reaching it beforehand, um, before these cuts, um, especially for the older kids, because they don't move as much typically during recess time, they don't get as much um, activity. And also research shows that that activity is important too learning um, and to helping re retain information and um, keep them engaged. Um, along with all the arts, um, including all the specials, but I really feel like that's a, that's a big part of how some of these kids make it through their day. Mm -hmm. um, it's their favorite subjects. That's their favorite yeah. subjects. Yeah. Not everyone's, <coughs> but, um, and that's a, bi that's a big part of um, helping them learn and be engaged in school and making them happy about something. Um, and that often tends to carry into the classroom sometimes. Um, that time cut also kind of hurts some of our outdoor programming, which is pretty important to Romney. Um, skiing, snowshoeing. <coughs> we even did some snowboarding last year with the younger kids. You can't do it with 35 minutes. It's not long enough. Um, so, I, you know, there's ways that we are going to try to work around it this year and try to shuffle and take some minutes here and there, but um, it, it makes it really difficult. It makes it rushed. Um, and we'll see how it works, but I think it's going to be really challenging. And we'll, you know, has to pull from other people's times, morning meeting times, stuff like that, in order to happen. Um, so that's kind of unfortunate. Um, There's another thing, but I'll, when I think of it, I'll bring it up. What I'm finding over and over is that I'm having children come to me talking about how hard it is in the classroom, that there's not enough time for things. They feel very rushed. They feel stressed. I had a little one the other day crying, wishing they could go back to kindergarten because the classroom just feels like too much, there's too much work, and they don't have enough time in between each thing that they have to do, and just generally not feeling happy overall in school, which is really not what we want. We want them to feel comfortable and we want them to feel happy and open to learning, but when they're feeling stressed and like they don't want to come to school, then I think you can add as many minutes as you want to maths time and mm -hmm. literacy time, but if they're not available for learning, then it doesn't matter. And I've seen personally in the art lesson um, the change because I am in there, and I was in there previous years, and <clears throat> there, there is no time. And, you know, children coming from one class to another, they need some time to settle in and to begin to focus on what's happening. And by the time they come in and they get settled and they understand what it is they're supposed to do, they're basically just getting down to that when it's time to leave. So I feel like the, the quality of the time and the work in that classroom has suffered from my perspective. And I'm having children say, oh, this, this just isn't enough time. We need more time, and I want to do this. And it just, there just feels like there's an awful lot of pressure. Because so much of it now is about the maths and the literacy and other things seem to be. There's just not, there's not enough time to take care of all the things that you need to take care of with children. And there are children with learning issues, children with behavioral issues, and 
there isn't enough time to meet all those needs, and all of those needs are as important as knowing how to read and how to count. So, I think there's a little bit of binary thinking going on, um, and I think it's a straw man. I think that the, the conversation about whether we can have holistic education or high performance is a straw man. I think you can do both. Um, that's, that's what I want for our students, that's what I think most of our staff wants for the students. Um, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm like, pretty sure we're together on that. Um, and um, I also feel like this conversation, I can't, I'm like having a panic attack. There's like something going on in the room that's weird. I don't know what it is. It's like there's tension and weird, it's like some, there's some kind of, I don't know what's, I, I'm, I'm a little confused about what we're doing here, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean that with the utmost respect. I don't, I don't know what it is we're trying to decide about together, or what what it is that we're trying to. Uh, I don't, I don't really understand what's happening, and I'm feeling extreme anxiety about what's in the room, and um, I don't really know what to make of all that. But that's just how I'm feeling, and I am telling you how I'm feeling. Megan, I agree with you. I'm just because I feel like you put your neck out to speak, and I agree with you. It's a little uncomfortable. Um, what, what part? I mean, what do you think? Is, I mean, I think we're really trying to solicit information oh, from no, the folks I, who are I agree, doing it. but I, I feel like I thought we were coming here for one thing, and I feel like there's a lot of negativity, mm -hmm. and I wasn't expecting negativity. I don't think, yeah, and they worry about, like, we're going to head down that road. I feel like that's and, exactly. And I don't think that's going to be helpful. Okay. So um, I think we are trying to manage what um, the... Yeah, I mean, there's very grave concern about literacy and math, primarily math, I think, because I think literacy is less of a, mm -hmm. you know, less of a, of a uh, concern at this point. And so we are trying to figure out a time issue, and certainly we can take um, the time, because time is a finite resource um, and availability <coughs> at, at school. And we are just, you know, in terms of uh, making policy decisions on uh, prioritization. Um, and you know we would like to have it all, um, but I don't know if we can. And so you use high leverage teaching practices, which we're all working through. Of course, you can. Well, you know, not not with the, not if, if certain things take more time because then you have a finite space. So Chris, it, but we, we ask the teachers okay. here, and I now we've heard I, feedback, and like you're getting a little defensive. I'm, I want people know, to be able to want, share I I openly. Hope that's not coming for us. But okay. I, what I'm trying to do is solicit um, the information for policy decisions, um, because some policy decisions will be made, I think. I don't think the amount of time in math is a policy decision, so well, I'm confused about how you brought in math and time. Um, because if, if the goal is to prioritize math learning, and the idea is that you need more time for math learning, it's taking away time from somewhere else, because there's only so much time in the school day, that's mm -hmm. why. And it's, it's just simple math um, if you're going to do it that way and you know we have a community um, and what what are their interests their interests may not be in wanting to have more time for math and we we claim that we want to have community input on issues like that and so I think that's what we're trying to hear I'll just uh, say that you know that regardless of what, whether it gets initiated from the top down or from the bottom up you know in order to have any kind of a program, you do have to make scheduling decisions. You know, you do have to say, uh, let's have third grade math start at 9.30. You know, and so whether it's a top-down policy or an in-house policy, you know, we, you know, we don't have a free form education in here. You know, and we're all, you know, because there are so many new initiatives, some of them are assessment initiatives, some of them are, um, teaching approach initiatives. You know, there's, I think teachers um, do want to have the, I think I hear from teachers that they actually do want to have what Meg was saying. They want to sort of have their cake and eat it too. And I feel like a lot of the anxiety that I hear from teachers is because it starts to feel like it's not, you know, that it's, it's not a binary, you know, it's, that it's, it's getting lopsided. And, and I think it's partly because of the, um, uh, Partly to put new things in place, you have to put a lot of emphasis on them just to institute them. And 
you know, get the machining working right. We're doing a we're doing a whole lot of things for the first time. You know, we've got, you know, in one year to just have uh, the the different initiatives that we've actually launched this year. It's a lot of new things, and so of course, you know, just pragmatically, it, you know, those are going to focus uh, a lot of our time and attention to to get them on the ground and, and up and running. But I think that that besides the fact that it just takes a lot of um, problem solving and a lot of sorting out of schedules and things to to get you know a, a whole bunch of initiatives launched in the same small sort of window of you know, startup. Um, I think that the, I guess the character of many of the initiatives does um, make us wonder whether um, everybody is on the same page as far as wanting to have both things. You know, I I feel like I would never want to um, uh, go back to the uh, days when, you know, we didn't worry about, you know, whether kids of different income level had the same opportunities, or whether there was some sort of unwitting uh, bias in favor of some people in the community rather than the others. And the only way that we help ourselves learn about that is to is to to have meaningful data. You know, and some of that has to be quantifiable. But but I think that um, it's you know when when there's a whole lot of systems in place that take a lot of um, take a lot of um, systems management learning and, and um, the systems themselves are, you know, there a lot of them are software that's dependent by people that are racing to get something out the door so that, so that they can get the contracts from the state or from the federal government or something like that. These systems are far from perfect, you know, and um, so part of the struggle that teachers have is dealing with this fact that the systems are far from perfect. And learning how to use them in a meaningful way, and and uh, you know, even and I, I strongly subscribe to the idea that everybody has good intentions. I don't think anybody is trying to sabotage anybody else. I think everybody really wants to do, you know, what seems to be best for the kids. But I think, you know, because there are so many new pieces in place at once, you know, keeping that in sight and keeping the level of trust in those uh, intentions so that uh, not only do we trust that people are, are, in the end, trying to think about the kids, but that we trust each other as um, uh, collaborators in, in getting the kind of education that we want, not just that we're going to have high test scores, but we're going to have kids that love school and that love learning and, and to go on. To, to be able to trust that everybody's on the same page about that, you know, we have to have the time to, um, I guess, verify that. And right now, we're really working on systems. Um, I think some of the ambiance of negativity is coming from you know the feeling that seems to be pervading it that um, it's kind of this top-down view that some, we have to guarantee these outcomes and therefore something has to be cut. That set like a psychological anchor point for a lot of people that I don't think is necessarily a fundamental anchor point on the whole thing. Um, and unfortunately in psychology when you have an anchor, anchor point it's difficult to kind of get away from that and look at the bigger picture. And I very much agree on this idea of holistic education and uh, kind of the interdisciplinary nature of how much of learning goes on. Like when I was at the WCSU meeting last night and a hearing about how do we improve math, I'm thinking, okay, well, one of the reasons, one of the ways you do it is make it more fun by integrating it into other things. You don't think of math as its own separate little ball, but math affects music and it affects visual arts and it affects. Uh, eco, there are so many different ways that you can incorporate math into the curriculum that is not just a standalone, here's your 45 minutes of math class. And, you know, I granted I have a STEM bias, so I'm a little bit more inclined to think of ways that math is fun, because that's my profession, my life. But it can be in more ways. And some of the other things, of course, we talked about last night are, yes, it's different now, teaching Common Core versus the way we learned it when we were kids as far as rote memorization and so on. 
but I also happen to be a big believer in that Common Core is a better approach <laughs> to doing it. And that's what, you know, teaching people an intrinsic understanding of the way math relates to our world rather than just, oh, what's seven times eight? Yeah. Big, big difference. Mm -hmm. And so I think that to get rid of some of that ambiance and negativity, what we're looking at is not necessarily how, and, and believe, uh, we had a big discussion about this six months ago, a year ago, about this word guarantees too. Rather than a focusing on guarantees we're supposed to be making about the way other independent minds operate, that we work holistically for, um, you know, collaboratively for how do we make it better for everybody and not necessarily start with an anchor point that says we're going to have to cut something more to make that happen. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I totally understand and, un and feel the, the tension in the room and I think that that also comes from a point of um, you know we're all here and we're we're all caring we're you know we're we're here for Romney we're here for the kids but we also have to air you know these these concerns that we're having and you know I know when you said like how, how's it going and I think that sometimes people are you know are like okay I need to kind of say how, how I'm really feeling and I, I do have to um, to say with the, the specials that it's been really challenging this year um, and I can definitely see that and I know that that's probably not the road we want to go down in this meeting at the moment but I did want to kind of share my perspective as well that um, you know with the schedules of the K through 6 um, you know pre-K has had the adjusted times for that and we went um, from 30 minutes of library last year to zero and 30 minutes of music this year to 15 and it's really challenging with the back-to-back -back scheduling um, I know that our lovely music teacher has direct um, instrument instruction until 9 30 um, and then comes to me at 9 30 so the 15 is really 10 um, and so that's just really challenging I think at a very young level to get into it and then have it be over um, and I'm thinking in that way as well. And I meant to say this a while ago, but then I didn't get my, my snippet in, so I wanted to add that with you guys. I think as a staff, we have said that the, the schedule is the way that it is and that we'll never do it again this way, right? Because it is impacting negatively so many aspects of the building. And so having said that, we're now gonna move on. Like, okay, right. we can't change it, so we're gonna do the very best we can right now. Um, you know, we know tier two instruction should not be pulled out of tier one instruction, and that's what's happening. Right, so the most vulnerable kids are getting the least amount of instruction, and it's just because we're stuck in this very unusual configuration, and we now know we will never do that again. So that's a good thing. Can you just clarify that? Has a decision been made to have a different schedule for next year? Because that's the first I've heard of that, and that's the case, and that would set oh, a lot of my concerns well, not, at ease. You're not convinced that works? I, I kind of thought as a staff we said, yeah, this is not working. We tried a few things that wouldn't change. Yes, um, I tried that last Yeah, I kind of did to us starting the process yeah. very early yeah. this spring. Yeah. Yes, we're yeah. Totally. And it's the back-to-back -back schedules that just really took a huge chunk of the day that then gave us some really awkward little bits and pieces um, and yeah so yes I think we're committed that we're not doing it this way again so as a board member and I'm really green to this I there's a lot of stuff I don't know and I make lots of mistakes but my understanding is that the WCSU um, is like when Bill is describing how the curriculum is made he describes um, the teachers being ones who are making this. So I want to make sure, did, does everybody here feel like those curriculum camps or inputs are accessible to all of you? Is there something we can do to make to make it more accessible so that this input can be, sorry, one second, because when we were talking about math, like last night, there were we talked about math coaches, I heard about math coaching, I heard about um, pilot math programs, I heard about some online math stuff, but some of these other, like, these other ideas that you guys have, have brought up or that you seem to be alluding to weren't really mentioned, doesn't mean they're not there. So I'm wanting to know if there's, an, like, is there something that as a board we can help make things more accessible so that these ideas can be shared? Sorry, I think there's been. Yeah, well, I think, I think that that work is super important. It's great 
that work is great work. Um, the <coughs> curriculum camps and the curriculum work that staff's involved in. I'm on a bunch of those committees, and, um, and the work that we do there is great work. Um, and I think that one of the challenges that, that I'm finding is that there's all this great work being done, and then there are these measurements that may or may not align um, with the work that we're doing. And so in that way, um, there's like this, this built-in conflict between the work and then the expectation that we have for students. Um, as it's as it's being measured by things like the SBAX and Star 360, which I'm which I'm not completely averse to. I think it's important to some degree for kids to know where they are relative to other kids. Like I think that that's that's helpful um, because you know that's a good that can be a good reflection of you know our practice. Um, I, I'd also say. Um, that then that also runs kind of like in this conflict with this um, idea of a guarantee um, because you're doing kind of like this holistic work around um, the, the expectations that we want for kids to have um, that isn't defined in, in alignment with the measurements that we're using. So we're doing all this great work, it's not aligned, and then like words like guarantee start getting thrown around and that's uncomfortable I mean that's uncomfortable for me um, and I guess I could share a short story I've shared this anecdote with some people I think and um, it's like um, if I were a building contractor and uh, somebody called me up and they needed a new roof on their house they um, I, I could say sure and I have two options I could go back to my wood shop and I could cut wood shingles and it would be beautiful and it would be creative and it would be all the things that I'd want it to be. And I'd put it on the house and then, you know, lo and behold, the, the roof leaks and, you know, like who's, who's responsible, you know, who's responsible for this, you know, roof that's not supposed to leak? Well, I, I suppose I would be, you know, I made the shingles, I did the work, you know, that's what happened. And so if you run that in contrast with saying like, okay, I'm gonna go out and um, as a contractor and I'm going to get, uh, you know, specified building materials. Um, I'm going to get trained on how to install them. I'm going to install them to spec. Um, then what happens if the roof leaks? Well, then, well, I mean, like, you could look at this place, like who's responsible? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's is, it, is it the manufacturer? You know, because it's not the person who put, you know, it's not me. I, did the thing, you know, I went to the class, I got the materials, I put the roof on, the roof leaks. So, you know, don't come to me about it. It's like, this is a manufacturer problem. So like, in a guarantee system, I'm much more comfortable with getting the guarantee, with getting the, the company, the company approved, you know, materials. Um, it, it dissuades me from trying to do something in my wood shop. Um, and, I, and I don't know, um, I don't know if that helps, but I think that that's the conflict that I'm running into because I see the value in a lot of these different things. But instead of seeing how those things can work together, it's like these things are being pitted against each other as in like an either or, it's like a zero sum and there's not proper weight being put on anything. It's like all the weight on one, all the weight on the other. And I think, um, I mean, that's reflective of like the world we're living in right now, but I, I would hope better for us, you know, that we would be able to find a Kind of a creative way out of that out of that challenge but as a teacher it's deeply concerning to hear words like guarantee when i don't have a math curriculum i don't have a reading curriculum and i don't have a writing curriculum and i'm not advocating for that i'm not what i'm saying is is that if we're going to guarantee you know outcomes then i'm left with very few options as to what is palatable to me as it relates to my own professional risk so Students aren't making progress, adequate progress toward what? Achievement, success, all of these things. Like, back up a little bit. We need to, I think it would be helpful for all of us to define clearly what we mean by words like achievement and success and outcome. Does that mean graduation? Does that mean college matriculation? Like, what are those words actually meaning? And that, I think, would give us clarity on a path forward. Um, but back to the other thing, it's, it, you know, it's a risk to do something that's off the book. Because if your students aren't making progress in the way that the system would ask you <coughs> to 
to have your students making progress, you're left in a lurch because now you're only responsible to yourself. There's nothing else to say, well, you know, I did, I did the thing that they told me to do and like, it's not happening and, you know. So I think that um, trying to find a way where those two things, these, can, these kind of, these different interests um, can somehow find a place to live together. Um, so I hope that that's kind of like the direction that we're going in, but I think the definitions <clears throat> would be really helpful. You know, I'm not sure that we have a clear group definition here as to what we mean by achievement, what we mean by success, and what we mean by like a successful outcome. Um, those would be really helpful for me um, because if what we're talking about is high school graduation, um, then that's one thing. If we're talking about like kids being literate and numerate, that's, that's something else. Um, so I think that would just be like a helpful first step is to like, identify what it is that we're talking about and then and then try to do the really hard work of trying to figure out if and how these two things can fit together that's that's I think what would that might be helpful it would be helpful for me I guess um, is there in, you know, we have the um, test assessments and I'm assuming there are other assessments that the that you know how your students are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, th we have the testing assessments, mm -hmm. which is really, <laughs> what, really what the driver is. I get like S and yeah, yeah. toward proficiency. Yeah, more standardized. Right, tests. right. Mm -hmm. And then, is there another assessment tool that uh, teachers use to determine how their students mm -hmm. are doing? Sure. Like, and is, so it sounds to me like sometimes those are not necessarily in line with each other, um, uh, and they don't have, need to be. I guess. Well, I would, well, first of all, like I have no way of knowing like what the expectation is um, at a given point in the year for Star 360 or for the SBACs. Mm -hmm. So as a teacher, I'm kind of at a loss as to what it is that is going to best prepare my kids for the thing that they're about to be asked to do. Right. So I think in that way, that's, that's a little, that's difficult. You don't know what's that's, on the test? Well, no, I, no, mm -hmm. well, no. So, so like to the degree that the scope and sequence that's built into these standardized tests align with the scope and sequence that's been done in the great work that we've done as an SU um, isn't clear. We can see the common core standards that are, that are being covered, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, we, we can see the end of the year assessment. what we would expect yeah. kids to know. We know what standards are being year, covered. But what are they supposed to know in February? What right. are they supposed to know in March? I mean, those resources may be out there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, they are ones that, um, you know, that have been made wildly available to folks in this building, so far as I know. Um. <coughs> yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, 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 some, some of us recently went to a workshop and we looked at standards um, and we were sitting with other people in the state and we were finding that our you know, after you know, doing all this great work, but our standards were really not aligning mm -hmm. or vaguely aligning with Common Core standards, and um, it was a little perplexing when we looked at like, the what materials. What are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, when we were given the materials um, that you know other people are using and that are closely aligned with, you know, with the testing, and we were finding we are not. In our district, we hope that this is not what's happening, and um, I don't know. That was yeah. I'm <laughs> still thinking about that. But, so what was, the, what was the difference between the? It was <coughs> it was to look at the Common Core and breaking it down into like incremental steps, basically mm -hmm. for kids with special needs. But to to look at you know all the Common Core alignment and look at you know all the individual pieces. So we were with the the state and all the other districts that were looking at these and pieces I was looking, and. Of course, I was looking at the speaking and listening standards because that's my angle, and I'm finding that ours in the district are they're very broad um, and they're not broken down enough, and um, that brings me to that great curriculum work that happens at the beginning of the summer where it's not accessible to all of us because it's in the summer. Um, I wish um, there was a lot of work done there that um, uh, no SLP, for example, was there. Um, and I feel like um, that curriculum work <laughs> needs to happen during the school year and it needs to have more people at the table. 
Um, the other little piece that I just wanted to throw in was um, we have a very large high needs population at Romney mm -hmm. currently. We have over 30 students um, in special education. I remember having 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And Not that many years ago, like five years yeah. ago. Yeah. So of course that's and, and that's going in a different direction now, but that's also affecting it's affecting our numbers. Um, and it's you know, it's part of the challenges that we have right now. I was thinking of that too, just because I would think that um, <coughs> you know, knowing the data that there are more kids who are um, coming into foster care, kids with special needs, kids with behaviors coming into public schools, that that is at least in part why the shift happened in terms of being able to be more of, um, you know, arts and creative. I think that those pieces absolutely fit in, but when you're um, having such a diverse population, there is, um, sort of a need that arises to be a little more methodical and following um, measurable goals. So I'm thinking that's sort of partly responsible for the shift, I would think. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking, Martha? No, it was- Not to put you on the spot, but it looked like you had something. <laughs> well, I think our, our population is in some ways more aligned with the rest of Vermont. I think that we are more like other schools, we're not yeah. higher than other schools. I guess I want to make that clear. I don't think we're higher than other schools. Oh yeah, no. Right. I think that we were always this little bubble, and now we're not the bubble anymore. Got it. Mm -hmm. That was my mm -hmm. point. That mm -hmm. I think that it yeah. is, it is, and I also think that we haven't really adjusted to um, a lot of the behavioral special needs that we have, and that's district wide. I think we've kind of ignored it and sort of pushed it aside without really facing it and seeing that it is a big issue in our school, mm -hmm. and not just our schools, but all schools. And I think that it takes, it, it drains us all. Um, and that would bring me to the idea that I really would love to see more support systems. For example, a full-time guidance counselor. I think that we all know in the last few years that some of our um, social, emotional stuff has really been challenging for us. and. It all starts in preschool and kindergarten where we start teaching some of this stuff and I think we should really be putting a lot of work into that. My end is, if you ask me what I really want from Rummy School, I want us to graduate really happy, healthy kids who feel good about themselves as learners. And um, because I think that, matter of fact, I had a conversation with a parent today, a, a very special needs kid who was crying after a meeting and saying, Kids can be really happy doing, or adults can be really happy doing lots of different things. And you know, you can be, you know, a rocket scientist and a goat farmer, and both be really happy. And that we want to create um, kids who are, feel good about themselves and kids who are good learners, um, who like to learn. But that I have questions about how stressed some of our kids get trying to meet a standard. Mm -hmm. That they just either culturally, emotionally, biologically can't meet. And that's not always been where Romney has been, and I think it's where we are now, and I want us to really make this a happy place where kids love to learn and feel healthy and feel good about themselves. And I don't want us to pressure, be so pressured about academics that we don't look at the whole, pe whole person. And we are a different school than I think we were several years ago. We're more like in line with the rest of the world, and the world is very stressful for these kids and they're coming from two or three different homes, and I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. Every day they go to different places, and I want this to be a place that's enjoyable for them and not stressful, and that I think I have enough faith in our academic system that we will teach them the math and whatever the, the you know, math and literacy that they need to know, but I think we really have to look at the whole healthy kid. And I think we're all stressed by some of our high needs kids. You know, one of the things, one of the refrains in terms of um, at least the math um, is the foundational work and learning that needs to occur early on uh, in terms of if, if students aren't getting that and aren't mastering that, that they're deprived of the opportunity later right. um, because they cannot access the electives or coursework but are, end up doing remedial work at U32. Um, so if that is a a fact, um, it, 
do, do you have a sense of how we address that? Support staff? Well, one of the things that yeah, support, support staff. Mm -hmm. right? I think yeah. it's a shame that they can't access electives when they get up to U32, even if they're behind in their math and literacy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that makes me, I, you know, speaking yeah. to what Martha says, um, I want, I want our students, our graduates, I want them. I obviously math and literacy are important. I, that's the no, it's an, not even a, an issue to even consider them not being, but. I want them to have the like motivation, the knowledge, the the passion to go out and seek something that makes them happy, whether whatever career it might be, but to be able to even do that because they have the skills, because they've explored many different avenues on their way through their schooling. Mm -hmm. So to be able to like say, ah, maybe engineering's the way I should go, or maybe it's it's something completely different. So like to even have that skill or um, motivation or passion to like go after or even know that they can have that opportunity to succeed somewhere, um, but to, to have like, those experiences so that they know, they say, oh, that wasn't so much me, but this was great and I really enjoyed that and like, you know, work their way up. If, uh, yeah, I just. So to think about n not giving these opportunities when they're young and then even taking them away or not even giving them the opportunity to do it when they're in seventh, eighth grade, like that makes me cringe. It, it, I'm just I know, that that's, what, you're, that's what we and hear. And what I mean is electives, like electives that they want to pursue but they don't have the basic skills to pursue mm -hmm. is what I, I think I've heard. Basic skills. And that there needs to be a remedial... Um, they made a good yeah. point about teaching across the curriculum. But if they're um, passionate like, about that that elective, then they're going to work hard to get that skill that they need. I mean, I kind of look at it in that way. Mm -hmm. Like, don't don't underestimate a kid just because they don't have that skill. Then, give them something that they're really passionate about doing, and they'll work for it. But to like not give them that opportunity feels like it's going to be a failure. That's that's my perspective on something like that. And I think I think Daniel has something first. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually not sure what we're talking about. I'm sorry. I'm like this is a very um, dispersed conversation. I have a lot of things to say. I just don't know which one. So I'm gonna hold off. Thank you though. <laughs> like I I don't even know where to start. Um, but I'm like really. Well, we were originally supposed to talk about a guarantee. So are our teachers in support of the guarantee? No. No. Okay, no. 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 That seems like a really strong answer. I I agree. That word gives me, like, heart palpitations, too. Could I say something a little more about that? Yeah. Uh, because the guarantee is so closely tied to the way that we measure um, whether we're coming close to fulfilling the guarantee, uh, there's this irresistible pressure to do whatever it takes to get those test scores up. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily, sometimes it really helps um, us be more comprehensive in the way that we teach math. I'll focus on math because it is what people are concerned about because it's where I put most of my attention. But other times I think what happens is, is that um, we tend to think of what we need to do for the kids strictly in terms of what will get those test scores up. And if the, if the tests were more trustworthy in terms of you know, knowing that they weren't just pressure cooked by some company, and that they actually they actually seem to match up with you know our our years of experience in, in gauging whether kids really have math smarts and whether they really get it and whether they really love math. Um, you know, if those if those all sort of aligned, to use another technical word, if if the way we feel about what's happening for kids in math aligned with what we think these tests are asking for, then teaching to the tests would not feel like this forced thing. But uh, because the tests themselves are so imperfect, and because they don't align with each other, and because um, it's just so much work, even with great curriculum camps, to actually sort of solve that problem, you know, a problem that, you know, it's created by corporations that have tons of people with big names to, to market their stuff. Um, you know, 
you know, a handful of teachers at a curriculum camp are, are not going to come up with something that looks like it balances out against this product of, of um, big business education. You so know. just to clarify, because yeah. um, I am in support of a guarantee, but I would never force it on a staff that felt uncomfortable, and clearly there's a lot of discomfort with it. Um, the example of a guarantee that we were discussing was uh, by the end of third grade, all students will be able to read. We did not discuss how would we measure that? Would it be SMAC scores? This was about... Um, as a board committing that our students who go through Rumney will know how to read. And we would then look, if that didn't happen, where is support needed? Where could we put funds to help make this happen? So this discussion was definitely what needed to happen. And, and I, so I think it's totally off the table now. I just want to be clear. We were in no way, we have never been all about SBAC scores or um, just the test or teach to the test. The, the guarantee was a very specific, we were passionate that reading is the way to get kids to do anything they want. I, I hope that some of them do become goat farmers. They will not be successful if Unless they don't they know how to read. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just want us to be really clear about um, what it was we were discussing. And because we're a board and we were discussing it, it felt very top down. The idea that then we're going to cut something else, that's completely different. So we have not discussed cuts. Mm -hmm. We are discussing priorities. One of the priorities is it would be great if we didn't have to raise property taxes. But if we were putting that against every kid being able to read, then we, that's the tough choice we'd be making. So I just want to clarify, that was the intention of the guarantee. It wasn't to like shift teachers to just teach Common Core and don't step outside the curriculum and talk about anything social uh, or emotional. That was not the intention. So I just wanted to clarify that so that um, you at least knew where the mm -hmm. our passion about it came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about the guarantee, uh, I am all about guaranteeing that children have some nature of success, and I think that that is worth pursuing, and I think every teacher here would support a guarantee. Uh, however, I think the failure is in the structure and the understanding of what the guarantee is, and it's a failure culturally that we have across our nation. We look at ends. And that is not what education is. We need to talk about means. I am happy to guarantee means. I'm happy to guarantee that I will have one-on-one -on -one time with a child. I met with all 27 of my, 26 of my kids in math over the past couple days. I kept track of it. I spoke to each one individually. I met with them. I met with all 24 of them in language arts in the past two days. I have notes on where they are. Those are means that I can manage and control and that have built-in safeties. It's called Jadoka. Okay? It's a built-in safety system that if one of the kids is failing, they're going to see me within less than a week. I can talk to them, and we can evaluate what the problem is and move from there. If you're talking about having a guarantee at the end, that is a huge lead time of failure where we're putting out mistakes over and over repeated without measure. And that, I think, may have some concerns for people. So when we talk about a lot of these things, I think we need to remove ourselves from our cultural biases of where education is and what's valuable. For example, classroom time is not inherently valuable. They can sit silently in that room and I can have them for an hour of math. That does not make it valuable. Quality time, and how you define that, I don't know, is what's valuable. And those are the guarantees that we should pursue. It should look like more planning time, quality planning time, across and within teams. It should look like effective training for teachers that's guaranteed. Us spending time to write curriculum is beautiful, but a list of standards is not a curriculum. Okay? I've never been, one of the few times I've ever truly been embarrassed was in grad school. I gave a beautiful quote curriculum to my grad professor. He opened it up, looked through it. We probably spent over 120 hours writing this thing closed it, slid it back, and said, a list of activities is not a curriculum. Go back and try again. That was a big lesson for me. Lists are not curriculum, right? And so, you know, when we talk about curriculum camp, they're nice. They help me understand what I'm expected to do. But 
they're not curriculum. You know, we need to really consider what, you know, what are we teaching, how are we teaching it, and how are we measuring this so that we have constant improvement all the time. So, I mean, a guarantee, yeah, I'm all for it. Um, but what we guarantee and where we put the guarantee, I think, is the questions we should be asking, not if we should guarantee. Daniel, just so I have you yeah. said more um, quality planning time, and was there a second one too that? Oh yeah, I mean like training? talk about talk about quality just training. training. Like, okay. Yep. Well, you know, and that's a whole another big. That is another big issue. issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. When you say guarantee for reading, are you talking reading at a third grade level by third grade, or when you we say guarantee to read by the end of elementary school? Right. We hadn't defined we it at all. Okay. We were just that, saying I that make every point. kid by was the end of third grade would know how to read and on third grade level. We I don't know that we said I don't know that we said that but maybe we did. I think that was their articulation. Yeah, so that's what's on third grade level yeah. by third grade. By the end of right. yeah. So reading learning knowing to read by the you know graduating here is different than learning or being guaranteeing a third grade reading level by the end of third grade for every student. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really different to me. So one of the I think they should be able to read when they leave here. One of the big issues that came up with this word guarantee is, like, to go to Ben's analogy, or even what Daniel was talking about with means, is if you're guaranteeing a roof, you're guaranteeing the fitness of that roof to keep leaks out. You can guarantee your own performance in, in doing a task. When you try to guarantee how somebody else is going to perform well, yes. time now. <laughs> and that's, I think, where a big disconnect came. Even in Daniel speaking about it, as he said, I can guarantee that I will be providing enough quality time in order to be able to instruct this. But if you're trying to guarantee the outcome of somebody else's performance, you're just setting yourself up. No, I, I agree. I, I, totally I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I, I often find myself thinking of, of absolutely any standard. You know, I think of a pre-K standard, let's say, by the end of pre-K, they're going to count to 20. I don't want to guarantee that a pre-K student is going to count to 20 because they might not be ready to count to 20 by the end of pre-K. Maybe in June, right after it ends, they will mm -hmm. hit that mark and they will be sore from their counting. But I don't want to say, I will promise you that your child will count to 20 by June. Mm -hmm. so that I feels really unsettling. So the idea of the guarantee was not a that teacher, you, Diane, will make sure it, it was a collective. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an. It was a collective right. of this is our collective obligation to ensure that um, students have these skill levels at this grade. Um, so it wasn't really an individual that mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. Sorry, they you didn't, you didn't fulfill came. your guarantee. It, was, it really wasn't, and it was really more of a commitment to commit whatever resources would be needed. When you put an output on it, when you put a level, like that's right. already, you just, that can't happen. Because it will fall on the teacher grade teacher, because even if they've been behind for K2 yes. and they've been right. making adequate, or maybe not adequate, but making progress on their own track, it's going to fall on whoever is there in third grade, if we'll that's where the goal is. And I'm not saying that we're not all working to that, but that's just kind of what I think of okay. the feeling. Well, it kind of goes along with what other people are saying right now, which is what I'm really uncomfortable with about an end result guarantee is that I can't control circumstances, none of us can control circumstances that students are in who come to us and we have so many kids and it seems like more each year coming to us with trauma and it seems like if we're thinking about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need to be able to give kids a safe place to be and sometimes it means like, sadly, sometimes I have to pull somebody from math, and teachers have been so understanding about that when there just is not another time to do it because there is something really big happening for a student, and we, a guarantee for a student who is really just trying to be safe um, at home um, and their anxious and they're scared um, and there are so many kinds of trauma and we have some really challenging behavior issues and I don't expect that that's going to reduce um, and we need to be able to address those things and along with like, so important to read and that can help somebody who's experienced multiple traumas get um, be successful <coughs> in life and be happy and 
I mean, that's what we want is students to be successful in who they are as a human and be able to survive in society without needing tons of support every minute um, to be contributing members of society. But we do have a lot of students with trauma, um, and that really seems to be increasing. Um, and I think we can all keep kids improving, but if somebody's coming to us without any, so somebody who maybe hasn't even been in school um, for years and coming to us, and I can't imagine getting them to a certain, to put an, um, an end result guarantee on where they'll be. Um, but like Daniel had said, if we can um, more have expectations for what we can give each kid, because we can't control what they're coming from, and we can just do our very best to support them and keep them learning in, um, in all aspects of their lives. I have a couple things to add about that. One is uh, nobody's mentioned the fact that, that we have some kids that are just barely hitting the, their birthdays to, to make it into school, um, you know, and they're the young, they're, you know, they're maybe a year younger than other kids that were just on the other side of that line. There was some interesting research that came out in the last week that says that the rate of ADHD diagnoses um, is something like three times greater for kids who are at the young age of that. And yet, we don't talk about that. We don't allow a, a, for that when we're thinking about what kids should be able to perform at the end of, let's say, third grade. You know. And I think that I think there's just a whole lot about kids that we're starting to overlook. The other thing is is I really agree with Daniel's point of view on the thing, and part of the pressure that we feel when we talk about guarantees is that is that article uh, from uh, uh, Levinson and Cleveland. One of the re the very first recommendation is focus on student outcomes, not inputs. That is 180 degrees from what I hear Daniel saying. Okay, and I feel like um, there's got to be balance. That's the thing that I'm most concerned about is the lack of balance. I don't want to give up the use of astute test procedures and timely testing in order to just find out how kids do. But when I look at those test results, I want to remember that some of them were born in September and some of them were born born in, in uh, August. October. August. August. You know, I, you know I, I also want to think about um, you know, the fact that, you know, I want to see kids get these good scores, but I also want them to love learning. I want them to have an insatiable appetite. And if I get a kid who's got this, I, I know some kids right now that, that are not going to probably make the, the grade level benchmarks. Some of them really love learning. They've got a lot of catching up to do, but they really love learning. I don't worry about those kids so much, but if they get anxious because their test scores are not good, or I get anxious as a teacher because their test scores are not good, and I telegraph my anxiety to the child or to the family, you know, I don't think I'm doing that kid, you know, any favors. Does anybody, sorry, does anybody feel like, certainly of the board members, but does anybody feel like really taught, like figuring out how this idea of a guarantee could work is worth pursuing? Because it's, it's kind of seeming like it's not really like we should just move on from the guarantee thing. But am I missing that? Like, do, is there like another way that we could talk about the guarantee that would be helpful or somehow provide something a benefit? I think it helps to think about sort of what the motivation was behind proposing this. Um, and I think one of it is a one piece is a real concern for students who are struggling. And then the second one is a desire for board members to be able to do something to help, you know. And so I, I don't know that you can help us with the second, but maybe. But, you know, if you have, I, I would love to hear other thoughts. I've heard a lot about how to support students who are struggling. What can you do? You know, what do you need to do what, um, to do the best job of that, and how can we support it? And don't cut our paras. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I support that. Yeah. We need, I mean, I, and that's what we've heard. Yeah. We, yeah. we just heard from the superintendent, right? And I'm just astounded. Mm -hmm. Um, in the climate that we're teaching in, and that you would be pulling people who are directly supporting students. And I'm not saying that our support staffs are teaching, you know, our children, which is what I know he was saying, that it's better to have direct instruction come from highly qualified teachers. Um, really however, excellent. yeah, really <laughs> excellent yeah, really teachers. Excellent teachers. Really to. Um, but we need those people. I mean, you pull them out. Talk about our stress levels and our ability to get to those students 
um, that's just going to tip the balance completely in the wrong direction very quickly. So was the sense that I want a longer school day too, but that's just me. You want okay. longer okay. school day? Well, I sure do. That we have the shortest fun. school day I think in Central Vermont. Okay, so what? Let me put that. What did you say? That's Thirty minutes costs a million dollars. Really? Yeah, and they're yeah. worth it. Wow. And you're not arguing against it. Just, that's, 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 well, are you, are you make that combination of those bus roads. I mean, I just can't believe how short our day is. And our, our day is short. Our day is short, literally. It's just the shortest day in Central Vermont. And to that, and to that point, uh, you know, I think that um, a lot of these conversations, quite frankly, have been happening um, across the supervisory unions. Uh, all of the boards collectively have been talking about this. And it's like everything is on the table. I mean, that the idea of a longer school day or a longer school year are, are even out there. Uh, you know, what is it going to take to, you know, what are what are our priorities and um, and what is it going to take to meet those priorities? Uh, and uh, are we currently constituted to do it uh, in the manner that we're structured now? Uh, and uh, if, I, if I may, since I'm talking, I think that for one of the things that has, uh, I've been thinking about um, around this whole idea of guarantee or whatever type of thing you want to put on it is uh, this idea of sort of the, um, the learning trajectory of, of the students that come through here and that this is, we're on a continuum, right? And uh, this is just one part of, of their journey. And I think about, you know, at least seeing the numbers of kids that are, are going into U32 that are grade behind or grade two grades even behind in uh, certain uh, core areas in math uh, and literacy in particular. And uh, thinking about, you look at the, the outside, the other side of them coming out, well, we have a very good graduation rate. Uh, it's like one in three kids does not go on to any type of advanced education and you know, that does, whether it's traditional college or it's some other type of vocational um, uh, pursuit and to live in this state on a high school uh, diploma is really not sustainable uh, and so uh, I just that's that's where I kind of look at it is, is you know, what what can we do here that is going to set kids up for su continued success um, through U32 and, and beyond, uh, and uh, yeah. I I hear people's concerns about putting a word like guarantee on it. Um, I th I think I look at you know what what are what is our moonshot right? What are we hoping our kids are going to be? To achieve, and sort of that's the beacon that that guides us. And uh, um, how we um, how we get there is uh, we're not exactly sure, obviously. But uh, I think what for me it's like you know there's the stakes are pretty high. I don't know. I'm sort of at a loss for words <laughs> right what, now. Is it? Whatever happened to the language about goals? You know, guarantee just sort of popped up all of a sudden. I can commit myself. I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of creativity. I can commit myself 110% in the favor of all sorts of worthy goals. But I can't guarantee it. And I feel like in some ways for me to say that I can guarantee it or to promote myself as guaranteeing it is... It's a kind of hubris I really pull back from. I would much rather set strong goals. I mean, you mentioned the space program. Um, um, the United States was a, a little behind the curve. And when they tried to, to launch satellites into space, they failed. A, you know, They couldn't guarantee that they were going to beat the Russians to get a, a, a satellite in orbit. But they had it as a goal. You know? And you know, I like goal languages because it, I think there's more humility involved. You can still have the same measurements. Uh, you can still have the, you can still be as creative about thinking how you're going to pursue pursue those goals. I just think it's more honest. 
I think the, the concern with it is goal is that it is, you're expecting that you may not achieve it. Um, and that in, in terms of certain aspects of skills, that kids should, we should guarantee that they will have that skill. And, and I, again, I understand the, the uh, but I think that that was the sense of driving behind guarantee as opposed to goal, because we, oh, we are goal oriented. And so I think it was, you know, it was almost, uh, and, and I'm speaking for myself, because my <coughs> sense of it was that by staying with goals, you're allowing um, a modicum of failure for some kids because uh, they'll never make it anyway. But we've achieved our goal of 80% or 90% or whatever. And so that's, I'm just, uh, that's what I'm, um, I think I'm articulating uh, yeah, why the term really guarantee. <coughs> um, and you know, we talked about it, and, and you know, I was I'm in favor of striving for that. Um, but I was also saying if we, we shouldn't use the word unless we really mean it. Um, because right. people think of the word guarantee that it's a certainty. Um, and, yes. you know, so I was, yeah, right, that's, that's, I agree. That's, 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 so I was very concerned about using the word guarantee because you're talking about a certainty. But the goal of ensuring a certain basic fun foundational level of skills, and I, and I think Brian has a fair point in terms of the U32 students, but I think kids don't go on when they don't have the passion for the continued learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's when they're, you know, if, if the desire to learn is squelched, then it's like, oh, I'm done. I don't need to go on. I'm sick of this place. And that's where I think a lot of kids fall off the don't don't go on because they've lost that either curiosity or passion for pursuing I something. agree with you. Um, I think that's a really good point. The other thing to clarify is it was the board's guarantee to the community. It wasn't a guarantee that teachers were going to make. So for example, I'm just telling you where the excitement came from before we had this reality discussion. <laughs> but um, if, if we saw data that by the time students were leaving second grade, only two thirds were reading on grade level. So we had to make up a third. Well, then we might talk about how do we extend the school day and get kids home and get teachers paid to work with those students. How do we, we would prioritize funds to make it happen. Um, it, it wasn't about, we're gonna put more pressure on, on a system that's already feeling enough pressure. It was, it was a board guarantee mm -hmm. That, that would help us focus resources. Um, I, I guess that's it, resources, time and money. So, yeah. You know, I'd be willing to have a goal of 100% of anything. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to go, have a goal of, um, I, w I have the goal of having all the students that I work with actually exceed the standards. You know, I don't have to say I'm only, I'll be happy if it's 90%. I don't have to say that, but I still think that to use the word guarantee, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's, it's, you know, at first it sets me up for failure mm -hmm. in the eyes of the people who are the stakeholders in my job performance. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hammer didn't make good on his guarantee. He said he was going to have everybody doing this, and he didn't. Okay, I don't like living under that kind of pressure, even though I can have the goal that I'm going to have all my students excel um, and, and go beyond the standards. I think it's fair to say we will not be using the word guarantee. <laughs> we certainly want to be striving. Daniel? Um, I, I want to return to this idea. Whatever words you use, uh, I would deeply caution against the divisional concept of a board guarantee or a staff guarantee uh, in, or a goal or anything. That's too divisional. Um, we're all here for the same purpose. Uh, what I would, however, recommend is uh, decentralized knowledge or intelligence <clears throat> is deeply valuable in getting things done. Termites build beautiful nests. None of them know how they do it. That's fascinating. Um, there is, to decentralize the knowledge uh, and allow more uh, openness of flow of knowledge between the staff should be the guarantee. Explain what you mean by decentralized, please. please. Traditionally in America, we, are, we have a CEO or a colonel or any other a board that makes decisions and the idea comes down and directions are given. This is your curriculum, 
this is this is how you operate as a as a colonel because the general said so. That's how we operate. It's almost how all humans operate. <clears throat> Decentralized knowledge is the idea that um, I may not have all the answers, but when I work with everybody who has a few of the answers, suddenly the diversity of answers that's available to me is drastically deeper. And this is how a lot of nature works, like bees. Right? So they don't know how to pick the best nest, but they do know that if all of them kind of look at a few nests and then they vote, they'll get a pretty good one. So what I'm saying is that we have a wealth of knowledge here, and I think each one of us could offer one small solution or guarantee that would move forward this process, and that would be decentralizing it. Offering a guarantee, again, of an ends, or again, any word, goal, whatever. The focus on the ends is the failure. The focus on the relationship of how we get to some direction is what we should be looking at. I know personally for me, I have longer class times this year. It requires more planning. I have more personal meetings with kids. That requires additional planning. So where have I suffered in that place? Okay. If I were to solve that, if I were to seek quality in the moment where I could stop something, it would say, hey, actually I need like another 40 minutes of uninterrupted planning. Especially if I could contact other teachers to get a little support and help and understanding. So for today I had to run and grab books. That was silly that I had to rush that process. Right? So that decentralization is what we would be looking for, the process, not the product. Does that make some sense? I can keep going, I can talk forever. <laughs> I would like to piggyback on, a little bit on what Daniel's saying in that um, if the schedule, I think it's a schedule issue, but I think it's also the pressure, uh, you know, sort of a pressure where we're not allowed to really collaborate. And even if I wasn't teaching 21 sections of library classes in my week, um, and I was teaching, and I'm here, but yeah, there's 21, it, it, two at, you know, two at Doty and three at Rumney. Um, there's not a lot of built-in time where I, as a literacy and technology and coding expert, would really like to not just spend a half an hour with children, you know, offering them some tools in the library, but that I'm really spending time with my, the faculty so that they know what resources are here that they know what best resources, you know. So Daniel's planning this, you know, great project, which is gonna take quite a bit of time uh, to, to gather that material. And really, we had a three minute conversation. If we were given a 20 minute time or like a 45 minute, lots of amazing things could happen. And that's just one teacher. I never get to see Ben, like, you know. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a lot. You know, like it, so, you know, and I don't get to see pre-K, like, like, and that's true in all of the, you know, the specials areas. Like, I, I feel like we have these experts, and that if there was more, you know, time for people to collaborate and work together as professionals, that, that literacy and numeracy and all of those things, no matter what the area of expertise is, would, would rise because can I yeah do the staff think they have enough time to collaborate because that is something that you know we, has been said one of the primary um, factors in improving teaching skills is the opportunity for professional collaboration do you think you have enough time well, yeah, I mean I know you may be I mean I, I we hear that over and over uh, and if it's not happening, then we're not. I think, I think the weight um, of who we collaborate with has been defined by when we have our planning time. So we have our planning time when kids are at specials. Mm -hmm. So the specials teachers aren't accessible during the time that we're planning. Because they're with the students. Because yeah, they're with the students. Mm -hmm. So like it's this self-fulfilling prob problem. Yeah. Um, so this year I have more collaboration time than I've ever had with Christine and Bridget and my other classroom colleagues, which I uh, deeply value. 
but um, I don't have any time built into my daily schedule that allows me to collaborate with Allison or anybody else. I think another place where we don't have as much collaboration time, because I think Ben's description of what kind of time is available is fairly accurate, is that it used to be, uh, when I first started working here, that, that there was um, the amount of, I guess, um, administrative and systems maintenance business that had to come up uh, to be dealt with during our all staff meetings was much less, and so we had time to 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 compare notes on some great, you know, cross curricular ideas and integrated things and projects and special activities that we were going to do with the kids. We don't have that much time for that kind of conversation anymore because there's other things that sort of fill up the agenda. Uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to say is is that you know if the um, you know, you know, if if we had heard, um, I guess if we had been a fly on the flies on the wall, or been talking with the board as you considered this idea of the guarantee and understood that you were really trying to um, offer some um, reassurance to the community about whether kids were going to get what they need here, it'd be a different story than the way it feels to us because the way it felt to us when we started hearing this guarantee language it was almost as if it. You know, been hired hardwired into our job descriptions. You know that we would um, be able to deliver these things. You know that we would be able to uh, guarantee. You know what kind of progress each student was going to make. Things like that. And and so, to, to me, to hear you guys describe your process gives me a whole different slant on it than the way it felt when the language started coming down to us. You know, it came down to us. Um, Almost in terms, of, okay. This is what you have to do. You have to be able to fulfill this guarantee. It's like, you know, somebody else made the guarantee. You guys better make it happen. How did that happen? Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. Like how did? Like like how, how did they get? Yeah, well, so I guess how did? How were you? Were, were, were you or other staff members? I guess made to made to feel that way. I'm just, just, Can I answer that? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, the first time we heard about it was those of us who went to that large board meeting in November. Um, which is when we decided to have this meeting. Um, but then just recently Bill came and met with uh, some of the staff and um, it came up at that meeting too. He, basically he wanted to know our, I guess it was our budgeting priorities. He was just like there to gather information. But the guarantee came up and he was very clear about it that um, not only were some of the other schools um, thinking about it, but they had adopted it. And he, he led, and maybe I'm misrepresenting, but I was led to believe at that meeting that every other school had adopted it That's what I heard. besides yeah. us, and that the guarantee was, you're not, you may, this is very different from what you said, Caroline, the guarantee was third grade, you'd be reading at a third grade level by third grade. He said that. And I, and I think that that, and we talked fourth about grade that. numbers that, by that fourth accurate. grade, which is very, very different from what you said. And even further away from everything that we have said, so that so that is what other people heard. So that's where a lot of us got it. And then, of course, you know, when people were saying, "Well, what's this board meeting about?" Some of us, I'll, I'll plead guilty, um, we're we're reiterating that because that's what our superintendent told us. That's it's what I literally, too. Yeah. literally in so many words, that's what he told us. And that's, that's what he your said thing. at the meeting. You're okay. not. I mean, I totally okay. What's so that's why we have the impression that we're we, we said that like. To be fair, one example of such a guarantee would be, but we kept coming back to that one example of literacy at a third grade level by third grade and numeracy at a at fourth grade. At fourth grade. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we were talking numeracy about that. High grade level at grade right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So that's very that's different from what, what you're saying. I have a question for Ben to go back a little bit. It's Ben, right? <laughs> um, about collaborating with the Allied Arts teachers, I'm curious, does the... Um, Contractual work day and when students leave, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, no. So, um, so the way that it's applied here, I can't speak to all the schools in this SU, is that um, certified staff are supposed to be here by uh, uh, eight fifteen, and we leave at uh, three forty-five. So that's a half an hour before kids get here, and ten minutes after they, well, really five minutes after yeah. the buses roll out. Okay, and the. Um, 
early release Wednesdays are used for like administrative driven staff meeting? No, I mean not all of them. Like we do, we do have. I mean that's been that's been great. We have um, we have these open space times now where staff can um, kind of raise something that they want to lead a workshop on, and then we kind of split up and go to our own places and get the work done that um, that we need to do. So it's not all administratively driven. Okay. But that is yeah. sometimes challenging too because there might be one session that's happening that you might feel like you want to go to, and then another one that's happening at the same time that might be relevant to you as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's definitely helpful to have time to talk about. And, and we've had open space knocked out by other mm -hmm. priorities. Yes. You know, we, we, we've come to, yeah. to staff meeting expecting to, to get organized to do open space and something else came up. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just with a higher At least twice so, yeah. um, um, it I don't want to argue over the semantics of the word guarantee because it's clearly sort of a trigger for us in a way <laughs> to hear the word guarantee. I want to be careful. But I also want to say that when you say to a community member that you have a guarantee, that has meaning to it. So that it's nice to say, well, I know you don't really mean guarantee in that way, and I'm not going to argue semantics with you, Chris, because I really know that we want the same thing. But, you know, Joe Joe down the road hears guarantee, and we all know it has a word. And as Daniel said, I never want to be responsible for guaranteeing an outcome for a child because we have, we have no control over that. And so that's why I would like to move more into what Daniel talked about, which is we guarantee a process. We guarantee this is what we're going to give your child. We guarantee that your child will make progress, but we cannot guarantee an outcome. And one thing I wanted to make sure that this is sort of a side, but I want to get it in. Do you know that we have counselors who come into school twice a week? We have two different counselors in the community, and I want to make sure the board members know that. That, um, that we have kids that really are struggling, whether it's biological, whether it's situational, whether it's trauma, whatever it is, that we actually bring in two therapists from the community and we have them booked two days a week mm -hmm. to see kids on a regular basis. And these are kids, this is aside from parents saying, I'm taking my child to see so-and-so, because we feel that their mental health is so getting in the way of their learning. And this isn't home stuff. This is worth saying, if it's a home thing, parents sort of need to take care of it. These are kids for whom, and we have two full you know, days of therapy, saying this kid can't learn, and we do pull them from math, and we do pull them from art, because they can't see everybody in morning meeting as much as Diana would like <laughs> all the kids to see during morning meeting. We pull kids from math and literacy every week for two solid days, because we believe that those kids can't access their learning. That's the reality of the world we're living in. For some kids, it's a divorce, and in six months or a year, maybe we can transition them out of it. There are some kids for whom they've been doing it since kindergarten because their personal lives are so stressful. So we can give 100 hours of math a day, but some of those kids are absolutely not available to learn it at that moment. And if we don't address that piece, um, we're stuck. I love point, that. I and how imagine. how is that? Um, how do we? How did it come to be that that is in place here? Oh, we have something called. We've always had something called an EST, or not oh, EST. Yeah. We now call it SST. We've had a lot of acronyms, and it's always been um, the guidance counselor, um, the nurse, the principal, and then invited people related on who those kids are. Um, and now it's Chris Malone because he's behavior and we meet once a week. We've done this since I've been here. It's actually was mandated. I don't know if it's still mandated anymore, but it was mandated by, an by AOE team. at one yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And um, we sort of identify kids that are struggling for emotional behavioral reasons and they're referred by teachers or whatever. Um, and um, we talk to families. Um, sometimes families come to us and say, is there a way, is there a counselor, do you know of a counselor? And for parents that can do it, they may take them after school, mm -hmm. but as the therapists are saying, we can't see everybody at four o'clock. Right. Right. Um, and also we found that taking a kid out for two hours so they can drive to Montpelier yeah. and come back doesn't work. Because the reality is we're in a rural community and it's and it's really difficult. So this is paid for, this is this is outside counseling, but we give them, we a, give space. them a space. We give them a space, they're not what I, or insurance. And, and what I love most about it is that the, 
trauma and the healing from trauma is being left to the mental health professionals. One thing I worry about, I, I want educators having trauma training. It's really important to know, but to the think that you are going to be an expert on trauma or that that's your responsibility has always sort of been a concern of mine. So I love, I love that. But the fact is I want to say that to guarantee an outcome when you've got kids for lots of different reasons, mm -hmm. whether it's, for example, they have a severe learning disability and they spend their whole lives feeling like I'm not a good person, so they act out. There's a perfectly good example. Mm -hmm. We have a therapist who sort of works with them so that maybe they can be a little more productive in class. So I would really, really ask that you please not focus on an outcome and focus, as Daniel said, on what we can offer kids. But I'll never guarantee that you know, that you can, you know, make 10 hoops in a row in basketball, because you just may not ever be a good basketball player, or that you can run a marathon in 10 minutes. And I totally cut you off, Brian. Did you have something no, to say? Okay. Uh, I'm actually back to the question that you asked. I think we've gone all the different topics here, but the question was on collaboration. And oh, on yes. Um, and, uh, and the topic of staff meetings, and uh, one of our staff meetings once a month is dedicated to, it was actually yesterday, to inputting uh, data into Infinite Campus. And while I really am thankful that um, Amy has allocated that time for us to do that, it is another taxation on our time collectively to be able to be working together. And that's a new, um, a new thing this year. It started last year. Um, but I think that's something to look at as far as just putting a value on on how our input into that is how how much is it improving um, the education for our kids, the time invested in um, you as a highly educated three being three one four three them. three four um, putting them into IC. Um, I I don't value that time. Uh, and I don't feel like it's, I feel like conversations I can have with family are, are way more um, valuable. Um, I know that we're just, the, the goal of the district through that is just more information for families so that they know where their child is at, and I understand that. Um, but when we talk about um, time as a limited commodity or a limited mm -hmm. resource that we have, that, that is taking up time. Is, is someone else able to do it? I mean, yeah, kind of like putting in invoices. Exactly, you know, just, that was my question. Can, too. can there be a data, higher data? Could it be entered by somebody who's not the teacher, or is it something that you would have to? Then you would to have to take the time. Right, yeah. So it would just be putting a, yeah. it. So it can't be. You have to give it to them on like paper. Even if you get it to them, you know? paper, you're not there typing it all. Is, it, is there a cost? Still doing the, the time work. savings in that? What? Like, I feel like you, we'd still be doing the work of providing the information to give to another person. So then it's almost like double the work. So it can't, For be, yeah. it can't just be handed over mm -hmm. and typed in. No. For me, also, just it goes back to that feeling at an early years level um, where like I really value <laughs> the whole child and um, a play-based education and that I'm, and, and academic growth, that balance. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I, I I'm striving for every every year, but it just doesn't feel right um, mm -hmm. at an early years level to be going three. Yeah. Science, science, like. <laughs> 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 so we're, like or, or we're we're <laughs> out we're out in the the world. We're in eco every Friday, and we're mm -hmm. they are exploring nature, and we are um, learning a lot about the world. I don't feel like I need to assess that at that point in their development and mm -hmm. put it into IC. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, my time is more valuable planning for that and, and um, um, react, uh, taking the experiences, thinking about how it went, and, and changing it for the next time. So that, that has been an area of stress for me in the past couple of years, um, and I think that that is another thing that just, um, yeah, it just creates, it takes away from the time we have to put towards planning. And I know like there's some schools in Chittenden County where they pay um, the expectations that the paraeducators do like photocopying and paperwork stuff. 
with the expectation that then teachers are freed up to meet with parents more often. Um, so that's why I was sort of, well, Chris was asking about. So, so, so Dave? Yeah, I just have a quick question about, uh, does anybody know the correctness of the understanding that uh, other, all of the other boards in the SU have adopted some I sort of language? Think, I, don't I don't think know. East Montclair is the only one that has adopted a guarantee, is my belief. Jody was close, though, when he was here last, I thought. Matthew, uh, that's I don't that's think they, the other boards yeah. have actually yeah. adopted it. So I, I told I, us yesterday, because I, I, I told it East Montpelier as well, and Amy uh, yesterday to the para staff said, well, I think it's a lot more than just East Montpelier. It's all, I, I think all of them have. Uh, that's what we heard. Because I, I okay, said East be new the board meeting, I believe Bill said East Montpelier had adopted it. Boom. That was the only one. But yesterday, Amy said, it's a lot more than East Montpelier. It's, I think they've all, they either all adopted it or all. I will find out. I will find out. I will let everybody know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speak to Caroline's uh, um, idea of the, the paper thing. That's what I did last year. I had these like 11 by 17 pieces. I mean, it was sizable um, so that I could keep track of all these different performance indicators and standards that we were having for kids and so that's what I did and I, it was funny because that was one of the things that I said I was like wouldn't it be great if I could just take this pile of paper and like mm -hmm. give it to somebody who could just like do this a lot faster than I can um, so that was the first thing and I think uh, Chris I wanted to go back to your point um, because I, I just want to pose a question and I don't know I mean I haven't thought a lot about it um, but um, like when I hear the word guarantee there's like an implied or else like if I buy a fridge or a car or like a whole you know list of things that have like guarantees mm -hmm. and so like I wonder in the case of this guarantee what is the what else and if there isn't one then how is it different than making a goal I guess that would be my question death by dragon no. <laughs> sign, sign me sign me up. Sign me up. Oh, oh, good to go. <laughs> but you are else but by someone who can support the guarantee. We would dedicate resources to and it, it was not individuals. It wasn't like oh the, the, it wouldn't be the teacher failed, it would be we failed. No, I, um, I to, so I guess then the question is then what's the difference of, of using the word goal instead of well, because because if, if the goal, if you're saying we have a goal of 100%, um, it, it I think builds into it, at least an expectation or a a plausible denial. It was only a goal, um, and and that's really like if you have a guarantee for your refrigerator, when you put it, you expect it to work. And so that I think that's the psychological difference between the two. So you're thinking that. So what I hear you saying is that if I don't use the word guarantee, that somehow. I have a different expectation no. for my students. No, I'm no. saying as a, as a, uh, as a um, representation to our community, we have a different um, responsibility to ensure that each student, not, and it really, it was not a teacher-based. No, I get it. And, 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 and it was no, and it was certainly no statement, we don't think you guys are working hard enough or have great concern and dedicated to your students. It was nothing like that, it was just, so like as an outcome, then, yeah. as a, a process, because that's all really then if we're talking about, what's the, di what's the difference? Well, actually, it's talking about the result. And I think Daniel makes a good point of saying guaranteeing the process. No, I'm saying as an outcome, you're talking about then like if, if you don't meet the goal, then that activates something, yeah, some process of reflection. <laughs> My question is, is like how does that... How does that? I'm asking how does the how does the outcome of like the process that goes forward from a failed guarantee or a failed goal differ? How do those two things differ, regardless of what you call it? Well, but I think the the, the word guarantee has a much different. Uh, you, the, the ramification is much exactly. different. The like when uh, I don't know who was was talking about the person down the street thinking right. guarantee in a right. legal sense of yeah. saying you're guaranteeing that you're going to do it, so you. Better and so that that and, and I and I think folks would say the goal is different than a guarantee. I think Pete that and that's where I was going. I was saying guarantee. If we're going to say guarantee, you have to be willing to. And then let me just circle back because I think that comes back to if we're guaranteeing a result here, um, and we're guaranteeing to rearrange resources, that's kind of can spread across the system in terms of okay, if we made this guarantee for literacy and math, um, and we're not meeting it, and we have to reallocate resources, that's, that 
kind of you, has a ripple so effect, would, which is problem can be problematic. So what I hear you saying is that y you wouldn't be so inclined to make the same decisions based on a goal, but you would be so inclined to make those kinds of decisions based on a guarantee. Um, you know, I don't know about that. I mean, that's what I hear you saying. That's what I hear you saying. It is a good question. Um, and I, I think we allocate resources when we hear there's a need. Right. So, I mean, I would, so, yeah, so I would just ask, yeah. I would just so ask, like, so whether, the word, saying, whether the word is important. I don't just say, oh, we're not going to do that because it's only a goal. I mean, I don't know. Has that has that been your experience that you experience people in this building treating the word goal that way? No. Has that been your experience? No, but and as I, a board, and I we have. hope that has not been your experience with the board in terms of. Not, not. Not that I'm willing to speak to you right now, but like, yeah. more in terms of not attaining them? Yeah, I'm yeah, not attaining them, not measuring them, not yeah. finalizing them. Yeah. I, I do. Are you but making progress towards them? What happens when this board is no longer a board because you're part yeah. of the larger, right? right? And yeah. so this conversation, even though I really value it and I think it's such an incredibly wonderful time that we're here together and talking about it, a year from now, you might not be a board anymore. And so. We'll be told what to do anyway. We're, yeah. <laughs> well, but you know, that, the hope is not that. Well, somebody from this board will represent. Right. Well, correct. Right. From me, and hopefully they at least one person will represent that. One or two, I think. Two. Yeah. Probably, probably two. I think that's a really important question. I guess I would put that back to you, which is to say, how would you want to communicate with, if not this board, then, a, then another board? You know, what, are the, what are the mechanisms that we can set in place, at least for our board now, and potentially? It's huge. And you know, in Washington West, which is where I'm from, that is what we're grappling with right now. I mean, it is a nasty environment there right now because of the lack of transparency and communication between the public and that larger board. It is, you, I don't know if you've read about it, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and so if that's where we're heading, um, who, who wants that? No Chris, wants that tell me no about it. If nobody wants it there. Um, so, you know, we're, um, you, you folks want to do this again? Would you like to do this on a regular basis? What? I have just one question. Yeah, I don't tell. like to tell. I'm going to turn into a pumpkin too, I promise. Yeah. But um, does anybody... Does anybody want to stick their neck out and provide any positive? So we talk a lot at the WCSU about these um, goals that really focus on proficiency levels, um, increasing, and these are all test-based. Can anybody give some of the positives of um, a strong focus on literacy and math proficiency? Because I didn't hear anything like that from any of you. I heard all sorts of other focuses. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, so just one thing is going well. Well, just like, because we talked a lot about, at the, like at the WCSU last night, we adopted a goal of all of, you know, Berlin gets from this many proficient in math to this many proficient in math, and Middlesex goes from this percent to this percent. So it's all endpoint based. And it's all based on testing, and it's, there's a strong focus on math and literacy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I've heard a lot of the reasons why maybe we shouldn't be focusing on those things. But I wondered if anybody has any reasons why we should be focusing on them. I don't think there's any. Look at that information. Is that I, I feel like. I mean, of course, of course, we all want kids to be math literate. Definitely, but yeah. I think that I think the problem is. It, because it goes without saying, and because people are concerned about whether the balances are whack, we've been talking about where it might be out of balance. But you know, you know, I see a lot of teachers teaching math and literacy, and I'm a certified elementary school teacher, not just a math geek. And <laughs> I have the utmost respect for the the skills and the motivation, the dedication of these teachers in, in the areas of literacy and math. So I feel like, even though we didn't talk about it, I feel like there's a really strong emphasis on it, and, and um, you know, it's partly because of the way that the, you know, the issues that came to this gathering um, shaped up that we focused on the things yeah. that we I'm haven't sorry. felt we've been heard about. I should we, rephrase. Yeah. I didn't think that you guys didn't think literacy yeah. and math was important. But what I'm trying to say is that we have at the WCS level, WCSU level a very strong, right now, a very strong focus on local and federal endpoints. And, you know, is there, so I guess what I'm just trying to say is I'm hearing a lot of people saying we should actually really try to get kids interested in learning and all these other things are to come. We should provide them with these classes that they love because then they're going to want to come to class, they're going to want to come to school and they're going to want to work harder. I'm hearing all those things. I'm not really hearing a lot of people saying, yeah, I really think that we should be working on getting our proficiency in math from 41% to 62%. So 
I was wondering if there's any. You know, one of the, one of what we were told is that uh, sorry, is that the goals that that were set were staff driven. Yes, we yeah. were. We That's what they represented. That the goals we were that were that. that were put up on board were staff yeah. driven, yeah. and said, "Yeah, to do that. what?" We were told that's what we're doing. What? We picked the numbers. Yeah. We did. Uh, we looked at this. That was all from the Star 360. It was from one was measurement, right. and we were asked to look at kids so who were in the yellow and the red and count how many we thought we could move. Okay. Right. So we were asked to do it. It did come from us, but it was from that one measure. So this um, wasn't you saying we should move the proficiencies. This is you answering questions. Yes, how how many of these kids do you think you, you can, can move? move. Okay. Can I have a so one test. Okay. Yeah. So um, did that when those questions were asked, were you asked? Uh, how can you increase artistic expression? That's a student learning outcome. No, Where you ask, no, how can you increase no. physical education, music, these other things? No. no. So I was at the meeting last night and it was very disturbing to me. It was, I saw a superintendent saying, math and literacy are what matters and nothing else. That was the underwriting message. And I saw the school board members as a whole not pushing back on that and that is going to be our board arguably that's our board now depending how you read what the state board ordered last week it's really not clear how much authority you have versus how much the larger board has already um, and I mean these are huge issues and I think we all need to be looking closely at it and looking at how our supervisory district is being run and it is not in the manner that this conversation has been talking about. And this is the conversation. This is what I want for my kids, mm -hmm. the whole child learning. And So I'm going to um, I would say that the, while the focus of the conversation was around math and literacy, I strongly disagree with the statement that um, it was with at the, you know, basically dismissing every other subject that, I mean, this is, everything that you talked about are part of the core learning outcomes that the, um, that the SU is striving, striving for, and that we've clearly set. Uh, so I think that that, I think that's an exaggeration. Um, you know, were we focused on math? Uh, yes, uh, because across the, uh, the supervisory union, we're under 50% in, in proficiency. And yes, that is for one uh, assessment of the, uh, the STAR 360. And I think everyone recognizes that there's, there's multiple ways in which we assess, um, uh, but this is one of them. And I think, um, so one of the things that the uh, supervisory union, so I sit on the school quality committee, that was asked to, uh, to recommend to the board, the SU board, a uh, a goal, and uh, in our student monitoring report for that was presented to us in October, uh, we were provided with the um, sort of each school's current uh, levels of proficiency and uh, what uh, the numbers of students that were proficient, and then I think um, what you were just alluding to is how many people uh, we could that could be moved in each school to advance one year's worth of uh, learning as well as how many would be proficient uh, and so we looked at that and said you know that's great this was uh, you know driven from the local schools from the staff creating this we want to support this it's at least something that can be measured and more importantly we want to then hear like know about what so like for example uh, what was asked was um, we also wanted to see something around literacy, but we wanted for teachers to uh, reflect and and basically learn from that process and what uh, what could be informed to do better or do differently. Um, but just as a starting point, I think uh, you know for um, uh, to look at how we are um, at least uh, across the supervisory union. Uh, Addressing the issue of math, and again, I, I, that while yes, that has been a somewhat of a focus, um, I, it is not at. I mean, I can can speak, you know, not for everyone, but 
you know, consistently at different these different meetings, uh, the whole idea of whole whole child, the idea of the importance of uh, student experience and how they are accessing learning, uh, the importance of the allied arts, are all fundamentally part of those those conversations. Um, and I think also um, one of the things that comes down to it again is the hours in the day and the resource. And I don't even want to say the resources available, but um, you know the way in which we can you know. I'm just going to back up. I think to Daniel's uh, point earlier about the sort of top down, as I, I, I don't think that is that is certainly the goal around of, of, of our board and I think of other boards to necessarily create this sort of top down uh, dictation of what is what is expected. And I think ideally it's, it will be a collaborative effort and that was again spoken about last night is that this is however we move forward um, is it has to be uh, moved forward in partnership with the board with the administration and with the staff and ultimately with the community so um, I think intentions good intentions are there um, unfortunately sometimes <coughs> not always the most clear communication I think also back. You, you, um, you just, um, there was a stress that um, in order to necessarily make or maybe improve math and literacy, if there's a reallocation, there'd be a prior prioritization. And um, in a in a atmosphere of a set budget in which we're not talking about increasing time. Um, then there would be a picking and choosing. Um, and I think when you're emphasizing uh, math or literacy, uh, the other things that would go away would probably be the allied arts. I mean, it wasn't said that, but when you're talking about prioritization, um, that, I, that would probably, I believe, would happen. Um, because, of, again, it's a finite resource. Time is a finite resource. Our budget is a finite resource. And if you're emphasizing and putting more time towards something, has to come from somewhere else, and just you know, shouldn't be pie in the sky here. And and you know we have. What's your what's your time frame for leaving? Because um, I know you have to go. You have to be in seven at seven, right? Uh, yeah, probably about um, no more than ten minutes. No more than ten minutes. Okay, so that's sorry. We're gonna lose our. I mean, we can stay, no, but we yeah. just don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Julie's kind of her hand is stuck in that position now. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I was trying to express earlier is that there has been this huge focus on maths and literacy improvement, which is fine and it should happen if improvement needs to be made. So in extending classes for those and whatever else has come into play, I feel that it feels that some of what is being lost is taking care of the whole child because these goals now have to be met. So I'm in classrooms where there are children who have behavioral issues, who have learning difficulties, who have very chaotic home lives, who then come into the classroom and act in a chaotic manner because that's all they know how to do. So those children already have difficulty, but those children are also having an impact on children who don't necessarily have learning difficulties, don't have behavioural issues, don't have chaotic home lives, but then find their classroom a chaotic environment because of all that's happening around them. So we, we have to look at how to take care of the needs of these children, those who have identified issues, but also those who are being affected by those children. And I feel like a lot of that is being lost, and this is what I'm dealing with a lot. And I happen to care very much about their emotional state, as I know we all do, and how they operate socially, how they are emotionally. And again, that has to be a factor in whatever you do. 
And if we can talk about guarantees and we can talk about goals and we can <coughs> issue all sorts of labels, but we need to really get down to looking at how we take care of these children from the very basic level, because it is having an impact on everything. And that was why I said you can add as many extra minutes of maths and literacy as you like, but if you're not taking care of that whole child, and I saw the video with the Nate Levinson thing, and it was a little bit of a derisory thing. Oh, they're going to say whole child, whole child. And we want that, but that's essential. Yeah. It's absolutely essential because we can make goals, we can make guarantees till the cows come home, and those children won't meet them if they are not settled enough in the classroom and within themselves to get there no matter how excellent the teachers are. And the teachers here are incredible. The support staff here are some of the highest caliber I've known. Some of them are or were licensed teachers. We're not just talking about people coming with the YLA children. So it was kind of hard to hear earlier, oh, well, this is all very negative. It's not negative, it's about being realistic about what the issues are at the core. So when you're talking about devising um, ways to teach maths and literacy in a better way or a more accessible way, look at these children and how you can meet their needs so that they can then go on to achieve those things. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, I have three really quick things. Brian, what you just said about the board is why I have been so against Act 46. I want all of you who are invested in our town to have a say. You, I know that our board has div you know, div divided opinions on things. You're always so civil to each other. You listen to us, you listen to each other. I, I trust the intentions of this board 100%. Whether I agree with you or on every single thing or not, I do, I trust this board that's looking for the, the best interest of these children. So thank you for that. I will say that what Kyle had said um, earlier was borne out in the meeting. Bill, again, in so many words, whoever was at that meeting can bear this out, he said what you said, but even stronger, Chris, that yes, we are focusing on math and science, and it really, it, he basically said allied arts people, because they were all there, just about, no, you are not the priority. Paris, you're not doing any instruction anymore. You're going to just be behaviorist. He, he, he challenged us, well, well, how are you going to pay for it? I'm like, I didn't think I was here to raise money. I thought you just wanted to know our priorities, you know? So he took that opportunity to tell us in no uncertain terms that Allied Arts, you are on the chopping block, basically, and Paris, you're part of the problem, so you can't do any instruction whatsoever. You, he said, yes, you will be converted to behaviors next year. That's what he told us, in so many words. So. It wasn't uh, your best intentions, and you're looking at whole child and wanting all those things. I believe you, but your boss <laughs> and our boss doesn't, and he said it in so many words. The last thing I want to have is a question for Allison. When you're looking for, you said you were going to look for how many other um, schools have adopted uh, a guarantee. One thing that would be interesting to me is how did they get there? Like what if they're like we're so against it. I would really be curious if, if you can parse it out, I don't know if you can, why, why do those communities seem to think that that's okay? Like why do they not have the same icky feeling that we do? Because that would, that would be interesting. I would like to know that. Um, it may not have been a community decision, quite yeah, frankly. Right. I mean, what? It would, we have to just put it through the story. So, um, Sharon and Oh, uh, just boards. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sharon? Um, okay. So, something else just regarding the Nate Levinson article that we didn't touch on that much was um, replacing paras, at least what I got from it, was um, changing funding so that paras were eventually replaced with coaches. Yeah. And that, that rubbed me almost more wrong than guarantees um, because with the amount of kids, I think about something like our first grade classroom right now, and mm -hmm. The amount, they're little children. Like, they're children. They're little people. And they need, the amount of help that's needed, even for kids who don't have learning, dis, um, learning difficulties and kids who don't have um, behavioral challenges or trauma, they're kids who 
have bloody noses or neither. I even though the kids who came up for their shoes being tied today to me when I'm coming in to start class. We need adults. We need loving, caring, supportive, skilled adults to work with kids because they're little people and they need to, they're here so many hours a day and need to feel like so they can learn, have to feel like this is a safe as where it has authority. Uh, I'm asking my board members as a community member's parent here that someone makes a motion saying that the Rumney School Board supports whole child learning, the allied arts, and our paraprofessionals. And that you have a vote on that right now. Uh, well, we're not here for next week. It's not going to be again the 13th. Good okay. point. Okay. <laughs> so if you can put that on the agenda then. Right. If other things should be added to that, no, now is the time to, to say what needs to be said. Um, I just want to touch upon the, the Nate Levinson model as well. Um, and I know we're, we're short for time, so I'll make that quick and sweet. Um, but, you know, the, the really excellent teacher portion of that, um, you know, just totally rubbed me the wrong way. Um, really excellent teacher or not, I think everybody is a really excellent teacher. I'm not going to speak for myself as a teacher, you know, other people can think what they, you know, say if I'm a really excellent teacher, I'm not going to broadcast I think I'm really excellent, but I would be nowhere without the paraprofessionals in my classroom. And I just want to make that perfectly clear that I am extremely capable at doing my job, but I cannot do it without them. Um, and yeah, and it does, and whether it is, like you said, a bloody nose, or a tied shoe, or yeah. tears, or a total, a total meltdown, meltdown in the middle of morning meeting, if I didn't have other adults in that classroom, the morning meeting's now over. Yeah. And, and that's just something that I can't say enough of, and I just wanted to make that really public. And Bill also said at that meeting about how we at Rumney have the Highest. Help me, the highest special ed mm -hmm. cost. cost. So, <laughs> no contest for that. So. <laughs> just throwing out there for that. So, so. that's a little. It was I trust it was very that it's true because you said that was true. Yeah. And yet, there is no business that I can think of where you would take the professional and you would not provide them with support staff. Yeah. I have two techs when I go to work. Right. Well, I have one that's with me. And yeah, I mean, I would be terrible as doing it as, as a doctor without being able to, to rely on this. So I was really surprised when I was hearing that just because I, I can't think of any other industry where that's the case where you send out sort of the, the, the support staff. Exactly. Yeah. Support. You know, um, the reason I wrote the long piece that I did for the, um, the, the survey was because I, I thought I better read the Levinson piece. I actually read two Levinson articles and went to their site. And I found plenty that was interesting about it, but, but um, the thing that I'm hearing tonight is that the things, the things that seem to grate the most, you know, have been things that it might have originated from Levinson, but they've been um, somehow they've been translated a couple different times so that when we've been hearing these things from people who have um, power over our job security and our evaluation. And, and decisions about our working conditions, when, the, when, when that kind of information uh, comes down as if it were, this, this is the way that this institution is going to function, it feels really different than the conversation that we're having with you as our board. You know, um, you know I, I, think, I, feel like, I feel like the kind of conversation we're having here, even though we don't all agree, is, is the kind of personal conversation the kind of relationships we want to have with our kids, you know, that some of them are difficult kids, some of them are kids that are just happy, happy, happy kids, but but we're but we treat them like a family, and, and I'm worried about if we implemented these um, recommendations, chapter and verse, what we would have is a bunch of different specialists shuttling in and out, and any one of them could be the person that says, well. I put the shingles on the roof according to the way I was trained. You know, I bought the shingles that were recommended in this in this um, this builder's guide. Everybody, you know, has has the um, has the out of saying, well, I'm just doing the things the way I was told, and I've just had this little. So don't blame me, you know, about this kid hating school. Don't blame me if this kid is not uh, reading at a third grade level. I feel like the. 
thing that really made me want to work here was when I first got hired, hired here, is that it really felt like a community of people that were supporting each other, using each other's resources, you know, and different people had different resources. You know, I didn't expect Scotty Brower and Mary Beth to be, Mary Beth Damaski to have identical teaching styles. They don't, you know. Um, everybody was different, but everybody had something to offer, and everybody shared what they had with everybody else. And that's a really different model than having, having, you know, hired guns come in. That's kind of pejorative, but having, <laughs> having, having people shoveling in and out to do this little piece of making things work, and, and somebody else doing a different little piece. You know, it feels like it'd be very fragmented, and and uh, and really erode the sense of community. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really quick. Yeah. Um, Sorry. The first I heard of Nate Levinson was, was when I read the post that you put in, Allison, as a community and a member and the parent, which I thought your post was great. Um, although I disagreed with the Allied Arts portion of it, and now we said it. <laughs> <laughs> now we said it to you. Um, but um, I, I didn't, I don't even know, who, I didn't, and maybe because I'm an Allied Arts teacher, I did not know who Nate Levinson was. I have not heard. I really, unless I did any research, <laughs> on so this is this is um, really interesting to me. Like, if we are putting into practice, or maybe potentially, I'll say, because people say, well, we haven't really fully adopted it. Um, why don't we know about him, or why aren't we clued into saying you might want to look into him a little bit? But um, so that's all I want to say. Thank you. I have to just thank you to respect yeah. time. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank